My friends, what is the longest running conflict in the Western Hemisphere? And what happens when a group of revolutionary guerrillas go and put down their weapons, put on suits, and then actually sit down in legitimate seats of power? Is it even possible to forgive 60 years of brutal violence? Well, go ahead and sit tight, and we're going to be explaining to you the very complicated and bloody history of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, more commonly known as FARC. And if you're wondering what the FARC I am talking about in the first place, please don't dislike this video for that pun right now. Don't worry, we're going to be diving into how FARC going straight would set off ripple effects of violence and unrest all across South America. This is a request that many of you all had when I did my Ecuador video a while back, and so this one is for you guys. But first, in order for us to be able to dive into all that, we're going to need to explain some context here in the first place. But my friends, before we get back into today's episode, I would just like to thank today's sponsor, Mysterium VPN. Guys, I will honestly never not do a VPN ad on this channel because considering everything that we talk about, you all know, whether it's Bangladesh, Egypt, anything we talk about with China, VPN services are honestly not just a good thing, they're arguably becoming more and more necessary as time goes on. And depending upon where you are, Mysterium VPN is probably going to be one of your best choices, as it is the largest VPN network in the entire world. Every time it is that you get onto the internet, there are people that can track you, from the government or otherwise. This is a real thing that happens. And so whether you are trying to just obscure where it is that you are, or whether or not you're trying to to get access to things for like Netflix and other countries or anything like that. Mysterium VPN has more IP addresses and locations than any other service that is out there. And I will honestly never stop taking VPN ads because as I said, it's one of the best services that you could possibly use and I want people to get the deals to be safe when they can. So my friends, by all means, please protect yourself. Go to mistvpn.net slash history and use my code history and you can get 83% off a two-year plan. Be safe on the internet, people. Going back in history, the early 20th century in Colombia was a time period that was characterized by, well, bloody battles, extreme cruelty, and suffering for the common man. Land-hungry peasants and their reformist allies would face off frequently against the country's landed elite class, who were in turn backed by the conservative hierarchy of the Catholic Church. The landowners and church leaders, along with peasants under their control, were then organized as the Conservative Party. Other, more reformed-minded peasants and their allies were known as the Liberals, with varying degrees of extremism on both sides. And so it is then that on the rich and violent soil of these conflicts, the origins of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, F-A-R-C, the country's most powerful present-day guerrilla group, originates. From the year 1930 to 1946, a series of Liberal Party-run administrations, referred to in Colombian history as the Liberal Republic, would go and initiate land reforms that restricted ancestral privileges and unleashed furious political opposition from the conservatives. Despite their desire for change, the big problem that the liberals faced in this time period is just massive internal divisions. And so they would fall from power in 1946, and a new conservative government would use political violence in order to regain the oligarchy's lands and hold on to that power. As an example of this, we would have Jorge Elisir Gaitan, who is a charismatic liberal and land reform movement leader who was gunned down in Bogota in 1948. Gaitan had served as the mayor of Bogota, a member of the House of Representatives of Colombia, and both Minister of National Education and also Minister of Labor, Health, and Social Welfare. This was a guy who did a lot, and it was firmly expected that he was going to win the presidency the following year, and he was such a man of the people, so to speak, that when he died, Colombia effectively lost its mind. In response to this action, popular insurrections would break out in the capital and in virtually every single city where liberals had a strong presence. This event is still remembered today and known as El Bogotazo. During a sudden outpouring of violence, anger, and grief, riots would destroy most of downtown Bogota. The assassination and subsequent riots would unleash a decade-long heightening of the old conflicts, and this new era of strife was simply known as La Violencia, the violence. The La Violencia conflict would take place between the military forces of Colombia and the National Police of Colombia, supported by Colombian Conservative Party paramilitary groups on one side, and on the other side, you would have paramilitary and guerrilla groups that were aligned with the Colombian Liberal Party and the Colombian Communist Party, with many other groups that were in turn kind of split between those. It's just, that's what you would have. If you're wondering how severe of a conflict we're talking about at this point, it would cause millions of people to abandon their homes and property. Media and news services failed to cover events accurately for fear of revenge attacks by either side, and the lack of public order and civil authority would prevent victims from laying any kind of charges against perpetrators. No one was willing to talk because depending upon who you spoke against, anyone and everyone could be the person that was about to put a bullet into the back of your head. 
Documented evidence from those years is rare, and it's extremely fragmented. But what is known is that during this time period, the Conservative Party would gain control and attempt to systemically eliminate the Liberal. Between 1948 and 1958, La Violencia would take the lives of more than 300,000 Colombians. To subdue the Liberal uprisings, the government gave weapons to Conservative peasants throughout the country, as well as backing from the National Police. At the same time, thousands of Liberal peasants would arm themselves against the Conservative government. On the Eastern Plains, peasants that were backed by the Liberal Party, with assistance from the Communist Party activists, would manage to form a 10,000-man army that would inspire the formation of smaller guerrilla groups throughout the entire countryside. One peasant guerrilla who emerged from the Liberal Uprising was a guy by the name of Pedro Antonio Marin. Later, he would become known as Manuel Marulanda Valles, or Tiro Fijo, Sure Shot. A few years into the conflict, in 1953, an anti-communist military strongman by the name of General Gustavo Rojas Pinilla would come to power by force. He was backed by elements within both the traditional parties and, can you possibly guess who? Yes, the United States. This is one of those many cases over the course of the Cold War time in which the United States would interfere with varying different countries throughout Latin and South America, specifically as a means to stop the spread of communism. Once securely in power, the general would decree an amnesty, which was welcomed by the armed peasants of the Eastern Plains, and actually many of the liberals and conservatives as well. People were generally happy with this. But that doesn't mean that peace was going to last. In 1955, a military operation was launched against rural regions that remained strongholds of agrarian guerrillas who had fought in the name of Gaitan, and where communist guerrillas were also concentrated. These were the people who did not lay down their arms and accept the amnesty. Backed by Washington's national security doctrine and a $170 million U.S. loan, Rojas Pinilla would begin to bomb guerrilla and opposition peasant position. The guerrilla movement would try to dig in and hold out in the highlands, but was ultimately forced to retreat to the jungles of the Andean foothills. In those regions, Tirafijo would organize a community based on economic self-management and military self-defense. He was assisted and joined by Jacobo Arenas, a charismatic Marxist ideologue who would describe himself as a professional revolutionary. So if you want to analyze this a little bit further, my friends, you essentially had Tirafijo as the military commander who knew how to inspire peasants, and Arenas was basically his country's version of Che Guevara, the communist icon that many of us are familiar with today. Together, these two men would form the backbone of the FARC. It was in the foothills of the Andean jungle that the first of these guerrilla bases that later came to be known as independent republics were created. But when Rojas Pinilla began to flirt with the idea of prolonging his rule, you know, as many military strongmen do throughout history, the liberals, who had hoped to win the next elections, withdrew their support from his regime. At that point, anti-Rojas Pinilla demonstrations would spread throughout the country, and many were very violently repressed as the government accused the communists of disturbing public order. Fast forward a little bit of time, and in 1958, the conservative and liberal elites would bring La Violencia to an official end with a a national front, something that would allow the two parties to share public offices and alternate in the presidency. But the arrangement did nothing to really resolve the underlying land conflicts and violence that continued in the countryside. Because of this, in 1964, only six years later, the army would go and attack the independent republics that were governed by Tirifio and Arenas. They attacked both by land and by air with 16,000 soldiers, and they would capture the encampments. But by this time, those encampments had already been abandoned. Some 43 guerrillas, including the two leaders, had fled and taken refuge in the mountains of the southwestern state, Kaka. It would be later that year that they would found FARC in the same area itself. The reason why it is that they did so at this point is that these rebel leaders saw that it would basically be impossible to break through the rigid political and agrarian structures using any kind of real legal means. So if they wanted to make any kind of change, then their opposition was going to need to be an armed one, an armed rebellion. During that same period, other guerrilla forces, the National Liberation Army, the ELN, in 1964, and the People's Liberation Army, the EPL, in 1967, these were also created and the big landowners dominated the country's economy. Things were getting very tense once again. Despite the tensions, in the 1970s, the National Front was still dominating political life, and on the economic front, the government of Misael Pastrana, who ruled from 1970 to 1974, would adopt a rural development model that aimed to eliminate all obstacles to free investment in the countryside. This led to concentration of land ownership and the undermining of small-scale peasant producers. 
Because of Pastrana's program, thousands of desperate peasants were propelled into both organized and spontaneous invasions of rural properties. On the Atlantic coast, as just an example, peasants would invade the large haciendas that were common to the region and distributed the land amongst themselves. Property owners, backed by the area's aggressive political bosses, would in turn respond with public and private force, and succeeded in recovering their land. Pastrana's economic development model also drove many peasants to the cities, raising urban unemployment and setting the stage for the Great National Civic Strike of 1977 and the draconian Security Statute of 1978 that drastically reduced the right to protest and organize. At the same time that this is happening, there was severe repression of the peasant movement, expulsion of small tenants from the lands that they cultivated, and just in general, expansion of commercial agriculture to less populated parts of the countryside, as well as colonization of unused land. Many of the most popular destinations lay in the same remote areas where the guerrillas were strong and where they constituted the only real actual authority. During this period, the FARC would consolidate its influence, opening some new areas and focusing on training military leaders. These were the days when many students, intellectuals, workers, and peasant leaders would go and actually join the guerrilla struggle against the government. To explain that, after surviving the first years of their very tenuous existence, the FARC began to grow slowly but steadily over the course of the 1970s. As they did, they adopted even more sophisticated tactics in both the military and political areas. They set up a seven personnel high command, the Secretariat, in 1974. They divided their army into fronts, with each running their own combat units, intelligence gathering, finances, logistics, public order, and mass work programs. They also even began infiltrating small towns, courting favor by imposing their own form of law and order. It was kind of like a gang, except instead of, you know, just wanton violence, it was simultaneously somewhat more legitimate government to try to undermine the authority of the current government. Well, I say legitimate, but uh, that all being said, one of the key ways that the FARC were able to raise funds for their struggle against the government was through large-scale kidnapping and extortion. Ah, uh, they were hands-down criminals. But for many Colombians who felt oppressed by the government, they remained romantic rebels who still might also kill you, and most definitely would still kidnap you. Their image over time would be polished by the government's brutal and violent oppression of any left-linked political movement, oppression which would push new recruits into the arms of Colombia's insurgent groups, with varying degrees of extremity between all of them. Between 1970 and 1982, the FARC would grow from a movement that only had around 500 people to a small army of 3,000, with a centralized hierarchical structure, a general staff, military code, training schools, political programs, Program, etc. Meanwhile, in the areas of colonization, the colonizers' situation was desperate. Bereft of all institutionalized support, these people would live as permanently displaced peasants, and this is exactly what would lead them to embrace the profitable cultivation of coca. Yes, my friends, coca leaves, which is used to make the famous white powder that we are all familiar with. Really, when we talk about anything being cultivated, no legal crop offered nearly the same number of advantages that coca still does to this day, which include the ease and economy of growing the Andean American plant that needs no fertilizer, no pesticides, nothing. There is already a ready market of local traffickers. There is a relatively fixed price for it, and there is constant demand due to addiction. This would be the true beginning of Colombian drug lords. At first, the guerrillas tried to resist growing coca, at least in their words. A number of varying groups, depending upon their ideological purity, suspected that coca represented a kind of underground imperialist invasion. Kind of like what, you know, people would later claim when they theorized about the CIA going in distributing crack in the inner cities in the U.S. during the 1980s. They also worried that peasants who became prosperous would stop supporting the revolutionary struggle because now they were rich and would be able to afford their own land. But guerrilla leaders would very quickly realize that banning coca would mean losing peasant support to the authority, and this realization would mark the birth of the infamous Gramaje, a coca trade tax that is nothing less than guerrilla imposed extortion of drug traffickers and prosperous coca farmers. This level of involvement by the guerrillas with coca led to the belief that they were the traffickers, or the narco-guerrillas. That notion is false, however, when you explain it like this. They are literally just a, another type of gang from that that is extorting the population, traffickers, and regular peasants alike. 
See, cultivation of illegal crops was established in the colonization areas, not simply because of weak army presence, but because the colonists were on the brink of ruin, and the gorillas were in the colonized regions long before coca cultivation ever actually appeared. Their growth was due to mainly the repression that was unleashed against popular protest and by growing impoverishment of the population, not their inherent participation in the drug trade. It's, it's more complex than what people give it credit for. Which, on that note, speaking of complexity, since the early 1980s, the history of the FARC has been a history of peace negotiation. At the beginning of his presidency, Belisario Bentecourt, who ruled from 1982 to 1986, would name a peace commission and talks between the insurgents and the government. The government's strategy was to offer to legalize the FARC's political activity and to convert their military force into a kind of political party. In 1984, the FARC would renounce kidnapping and the parties agreed to a general, verifiable ceasefire. As part of the process, the FARC would launch a political party, the Patriotic Union, or UP, in 1985. While it was that the FARC initially dominated the party, it also managed to capture the imagination of a broad range of leftists, peace campaigners, and those who were disillusioned with the closed shop political elite. In elections, the year after the UP was founded, it managed to win 14 congressional seats, two of which were to FARC commanders, along with numerous seats in the state congress, and 351 council seats. However, while the state was talking peace, a counterinsurgency movement was gathering strength in the shadows. Drug traffickers, landowners, and the country's social and economic elites were tired of the guerrillas' kidnapping and extortion, and they began to fight back with death squads and private armies. Meanwhile, the Sumapaz region, about 50 miles south of Bogota in the Department of Meta, this was cleared of the military and turned into an area where meetings could take place among representatives of the government, the guerrillas, and civil society. The site of the meetings, La Casa Verde, this would become famous as a hopeful symbol of the peace process. Just as the rules and conditions of negotiation were being agreed to, however, the urban guerrilla group, April 19th Movement, or M19, would seize the Palace of Justice, leading to the killing of over 100 people, including several Supreme Court justices. This absolute disaster dealt a crippling blow to the talks, which did continue, but in an atmosphere of, well, no one at that point could really trust each other. The Palace of Justice debacle, as well as pressure from business associations, all would come together to substantially change the nature of the negotiation. You see, my friends, at the beginning of Virgilio Barco's four-year presidency in 1986, the government offered a, quote, outstretched but firm hand to the guerrillas. Unlike President Benton Kerr, Barco tried to offer them full participation in civil and political life if they would lay down their weapons. The government called upon the guerrillas to demobilize and to disarm in exchange for political guarantees and economic compensation. Barco wanted to restore the legitimacy of the state, which had been badly damaged in the peasant areas and the territories of colonization. As violence once again escalated, the rebel groups opted to unify as the Simon Bolivar Guerrilla Coordinating Group, or CG. SB. There wasn't going to be peace. In early 1987, the army would go and unleash a powerful offensive against the fifth front of the FARC in the department of Araba at the behest of the Banana Company, who felt that the guerrillas were backing the Banana Workers Union and its drive for higher wages. A few months later, the guerrillas would destroy a military convoy in Caqueta and would kill 25 soldiers. The army would bombard the region and the government would end the truce. Meanwhile, as all of this is going down, paramilitary forces had been growing dramatically, in many cases financed by the head of the Mendelin cartel, Pablo Escobar. And this would be especially true around the northern region of Magdalena Medio. With Escobar's financing and the army's tolerance, paramilitaries began decimating the leftist UP with absolute impunity. It was during Barco's subsequent administration that most of the UP's activists would be, well, taken out to say the least. The paramilitary groups in many cases would be backed by the Colombian security forces, and they would see UP as the FARC's soft underbelly and easy target. Before the killing was done, an estimated 3,000 UP militants and leaders had died. Among them were eight congressmen, 13 state deputies, 70 councillors, and even 11 mayors. The final days of Barco's government were notably violent. Gunmen would assassinate four presidential candidates, Carlos Pizarro of the M-19, who had just turned in their arms, Jaime Pardo Leal of the UP, followed closely by his replacement, Bernardo Jaramillo, 
In addition, you would have the liberals Luis Carlos Galan, who would certainly have won the election if he had, well, not been gunned down. At least that is the most likely scenario considering popularity. If you're wondering why it is that we say that, Galan was replaced after his death with Cesar Gavaria, an individual who had been Minister of Government and who ultimately would win the election for presidency for the term of 1990 to 1994. Thus, it means that the previous guy probably would have won, considering everything. It fell to Gaviria to advocate the writing of a new constitution, a process that had been begun by Barco, but this was going to take some time. The FARC had launched the idea, and public opinion would baptize it in the peace constitution. Yet, the still-mobilized guerrilla alliance, the CGSB, was offered only 6 out of 70 seats in the Constituent Assembly, charged with drafting the new document. This small guerrilla representation had been the condition on which the military agreed to permit the process of rewriting the Constitution in the first place, and so really no matter what was going to happen, it was going to piss people off. That's, that's kind of what happens. The virtual absence of active guerrillas from what was called an Agreement on the Fundamentals had basically two goals. To reduce their political prominence and to make sure that the crucial theme of the military-civilian relations did not become subject to negotiation. The peace negotiations themselves, which by now had been moved to Caracas, would advance rapidly. Negotiators for both sides agreed to call for a ceasefire and an end to hostilities. For the government, this meant placing the guerrillas within fixed geographical boundaries in order to make verification of the ceasefire possible. It also meant that the guerrillas must suspend kidnappings, extortion, bombings, you know, physical infrastructure, literally any of the other illegal violent activities that they were engaging with. They had to stop all of it. But the guerrillas, in turn, refused to confine themselves geographically. They weren't going to restrict themselves to only one area, since that would mean that they had to give up their most effective weapon, being able to be anywhere all at once. And they demanded that the paramilitaries be disbanded. The government insisted on guerrilla demobilization as a condition for participation in the Constituent Assembly, and for its part, the CGSB would demand radical political reform first, beginning with the restructuring of the armed forces. Now, while the two sides could not really arrive in an agreement at that point, they did concur on verification and on the role of international oversight, neither of which could be enacted without an actual ceasefire. The government and the guerrillas also named a public order advisory commission, and the government further agreed to name a civilian as Minister of Defense, a position that usually had been reserved for the military since the onset of the National Front, and agreed to outlaw the paramilitary self-defense groups. But really, when we talk about this, these measures were more symbolic than real, and the government would demand that the guerrillas concentrate in 60 sites. For their part, the guerrillas demanded 200 demilitarized municipalities as well as meaningful, verifiable measures against the paramilitaries. Things were not really going anywhere very fast, and it's at this point that a failed assassination plot by guerrillas against a prominent senator by the name of Ario Irigori would lead the government to suspend the negotiations outright. But that's not to mean that it was the end. Weeks later, the conversations would resume, but naturally after an assassination attempt with less trust amongst the parties. Now, each would arrive with proposals that were impossible for the other to actually comply with. There was simply no way. The guerrillas had not ended their attacks against the oil pipelines, nor had they diminished their kidnappings or seizures of villages and police stations and general terror attacks. Because of things like this, the varying different business associations attacked the negotiations verbally and demanded that the government harden its bargaining position. In that context, both sides decided to, again, postpone the talks. Amidst this less-than-promising atmosphere, the Popular Liberation Army, the EPL, a minority group in the guerrilla coalition, would go and kidnap and kill a former conservative cabinet minister named Argelino Duran. The talks that we are speaking about here had begun with an agreement to continue them, come what may, but in the wake of the EPL action, the government once again would cancel the talks, and they collapsed in confusion. The guerrillas would emerge from the talks extremely divided. On one hand, two different guerrilla subgroups would use the accords to reinsert themselves into mainstream politics. These groups, the majority of the EPL, and a split off of the ELN, they gave up their arms as well as their areas of control. Immediately after they relinquished their territory, it was promptly then occupied by paramilitaries. Now, divisions began to grow within the CGSB, 
The issue was that FARC felt that the alliance between the varying different paramilitaries was imposing the interests of the minority over the majority, that the smaller, more violent, more ideologically pure or insane parties were going to completely collapse things, just as when the EPL went and kidnapped Duran, which went and collapsed the talks. For the ELN and EPL, however, the problem was that FARC wanted to dominate the coordinating groups. These differences were dangerous, but for the most part, they were kept under control, at least for a time. This would be done by moderating the influence of much of the guerrilla leadership. The paramilitaries, meanwhile, had been growing and attracting the sympathy of right-wing elements, which argued that these self-defense groups should be recognized as the third actor in the conflict. The army continued to facilitate paramilitary seizures of the most important economic, political, and military regions. These would be Uraba, the Banana Plantation area, the Panama border, and Montes de Maria, an area of big farms near Cartagena. Nothing was really being done, and in 1994, Ernesto Semper would assume the presidency. He was significantly weakened by the opposition's accusations that he had received campaign contributions from drug cartels in order to take power in the first place. His efforts at social reform, his attempted negotiations with the guerrillas, and his proposed political changes were just clouded over these accusations throughout his four years in office. Just a few days into his administration, the FARC would place conditions on the resumption of peace talks. A military withdrawal from the FARC-dominated municipality of La Uribe, this being in the Department of Meta, the demobilization of paramilitary groups, and suspension of government rewards for identifying kidnappers, a weapon that was used almost exclusively against the guerrillas because they were doing a lot of kidnapping. Samper would go and accept the withdrawal, limiting it to the rural areas of La Uribe, and he publicly recognized the political character of the conflict by denying that the guerrillas were simply a band of drug traffickers. He would also go and suspend the kidnapper identification rewards. As you can imagine, the right-wing elements of the government and the population were extremely unhappy with this, and the opposition would publicize statistics about guerrilla kidnappings and the guerrillas' links with drug traffickers. Only six months later, General Bedoya, commander of the armed forces, would threaten Semper with a military coup if the government ordered him to withdraw from La Uribe. The president, whose space for maneuvering was already severely limited by this point, would back down in the face of broad opposition, led by the U.S. ambassador, Colombia's archbishop primate, the conservative hierarchy, retired military officers, followers of ex-president Gaviria, the business associations, and even portions of the left that did not like how he was operating. Like, all of these guys teamed up to tell him, bro, what the hell, no, you can't do that. Like, this guy could not please anyone, really. Speaking of people who were not happy with the way things were turning out, the guerrillas would subsequently then go and cancel the reconciliation talks and resume their attacks on the armed forces. In June and July of 1996, guerrillas would mobilize in the departments of Guaviare, Putumayo, Caqueta, Norte de Santander, and Bolivar. Around that same time, nearly 200,000 peasants would feel the effect of drug eradication policies on their illicit crops and thus their economic well-being, which they were dependent upon. Recent aerial fumigations against legal and illegal crops, as well as the government attempts to stop the processing of coca leaves by declaring so-called special zones of public order, raised the peasant growers' cost of production, and therefore, the cost of their survival as well. The protest was repressed by the armed forces in a highly publicized way, making conflicts in the area of colonization visible and sensitizing the public to the reality of coca producers' lives. These events actually helped to humanize coca farmers, especially when strike leaders told the media about the government's disregard of their precarious conditions. It was after this that the guerrillas would establish closer relations with drug traffickers in order to be able to increase their cut of the profits, while in some areas they started to take on a more significant role in the trade itself, processing and smuggling some of the cocaine. In addition to these efforts with drug trafficking, they would also ramp up kidnapping and extortion to just unprecedented levels. This would make FARC richer than they had ever been before. This money would help build up their force to over 10 
8,000 fighters divided into 60 different fronts. It was at this point then, over the next year and a half or so, that the guerrilla movement would meet with substantial military success. They would manage to capture many army bases and villages and ambushing many different army patrols. These actions were increasingly ambitious and efficient. In August of 1996, they culminated in the destruction of the army base of Las Delicias in Caqueta and the capture of 60 soldiers. Immediately afterwards, the FARC would extend the offensive action throughout the territory, and Colombians began to feel that the state had just lost control of public order entirely. As the government withdrew, the vacuum would be filled by the paramilitaries, who would transform themselves into unofficial wings of the armed forces. This would only mean more violence. Another enemy, the Paramilitary Army of the United Self-Defense Force of Colombia, or AUC, this would be stronger than ever. The AUC was more deadly than the Colombian army, and crucially, it would fight the guerrillas using their own tactics. As brutality continued through the countryside, the military growth of the guerrillas was public knowledge. Everyone knew that they were there, everyone knew how powerful they were, and so they would propose releasing the prisoners that they held in exchange for the army's further withdrawal in Kaguan. The government would accept. The soldiers were handed over in July of 1997 under the supervision of the Red Cross and international observers from 13 different countries, mainly from Europe and Latin America. It would be during this event that the FARC would make several demands as a prerequisite for peace talks, that the army withdraw from the additional municipalities, that the guerrillas be treated with respect, and that popular protest be decriminalized. The government, losing prestige day by day, rejected the conditions and the army mounted a large military operation that, despite a massive propaganda effort, would produce absolutely no results. In this small test of strength, the FARC did rather well, actually. The government and the international community recognized their military strength, and the FARC's political presence in the country's interior began to seem as though it might be a decisive factor in the upcoming presidential elections. By 1998, in fact, despite furious opposition from the right and from the army, the leading presidential candidates began to court the insurgent. The conservative candidate, Andre Pastrana, had created channels of communication with the FARC. The liberal candidate, Horacio Serpa, had participated in previous contentious negotiations, so he was a bit more estranged. But both candidates stressed two fundamental promises, to withdraw from five municipalities and to deal directly with Marulanda in order to establish bases for negotiation. That implied visiting with FARC leaders in the military encampments. Pastrana succeeded in tilting the balance in his favor, and as soon as he won his narrow victory, he actually kept his word and he met with Marulanda. And from that, they would agree on the basis for negotiation withdrawal of military authority and police forces from the five municipalities, formation of a unarmed civic corps to keep local order in the demilitarized zone, dismantling of the paramilitary groups, decriminalization of popular protest, and convening of participation by the international community. Thus they began the process of negotiation. That being said, however, it does not mean that violence was going to stop. The new FARC military machine was going to go on the offensive. The rebels would launch bolder and grander attacks, and hit-and-run guerrilla tactics would give way to a war of movement with strikes against battalion-sized army units and military bases. The rebels increased their territorial control and began to meddle more and more and more in politics, buying influence through threats, through violence, corruption, and kidnapping high-profile politicians as well as their families. Among all of these that I could possibly mention, the most brazen and daring FARC attack would be launched in October of 1998, when close to 2,000 guerrillas would seize the town of Mitu, this being the capital of the department of Vapes. Although FARC would only own the town for about three days, the attack sent a powerful statement to newly elected President Andre Pastrana, one that he was unable to ignore. Just months after the seizure of Mitu, President Pastrana would concede to the FARC's preconditions to new peace talks a demilitarized zone covering 42,000 square kilometers that was home to 80,000 people. The region would become the FARC's de facto mini-state, something that would be dubbed Farklandia, which is a horrible sounding name in the first place. But at this point, with the hilarious name of Farklandia, you may think, okay, finally, this is the end, there is peace, we now have a division. Well, no, because what we have is the seeding of territory. And once you have two hostile powers who are next to each other with territory and an actual border, that means that there is more to fight over. The seeding of Farklandia to the rebels 
did not pay off. The rebels would use the territory to hold kidnapped victims, to plant drug crops and regroup, to retrain and build up strength. The government had hoped that the strains of administering the territory would prove to be draining, but instead the guerrillas reveled in their autonomy, proudly showing off their laboratory of peace. Any international journalist that wanted to go in and see them, they would welcome in and show off their territory and civil society. The FARC would also use the peace process to build international support and to push for recognition as a legitimate belligerent force in Colombia's conflict. However, they showed very little interest in actually negotiating to make any of this happen. The talks would stall time and time again, and eventually they would break down amidst mass kidnappings, hijackings, military assaults, and claims and counterclaims of bad faith and broken promises, which is what's going to happen oftentimes when you are dealing with drug traffickers. At the start of 2002, President Pastrana would declare the talks dead, they were over, and military hostilities would resume once again. The army moved against Farklandia, and the FARC would murder the governor of Antioquia and kidnap presidential candidate Ingrid Betancourt. By the time the peace talks had collapsed, the FARC had grown from 10,000 to anywhere between 15 to 20,000 men as part of their military force, which would occupy over a third of Colombian territory and was circling the main cities of Bogota, Mendelin, and Cali. This was an entity that was now well-armed, well-organized, and it was rich. The scenario that we were talking about is that the rebels had effectively reached the height of their power during the Pastrana peace talks, but by the time that military hostilities would resume, two new strong enemies were already looming on the horizon. The money, machines, and might of the U.S. military, and the cunning and determined and ruthless incoming president Alvaro Uribe. You see, my friends, in the year 2000, U.S. lawmakers approved Plan Colombia, an aid package that aimed to help the country combat guerrilla violence, to strengthen its institution, and stem drug production and trafficking, this being part of a grand-scale war on drugs. In addition to this aid, Washington would seek to bind the two countries closer through expanded trade. The U.S. is, after all, Colombia's largest trading partner, and a bilateral free trade agreement between the two would be entered in force in 2012. As for why part of the United States' war on drugs would take place in Colombia, here's the reason. In the early 2000s, Colombia supplied as much as 90% of the entire world's cocaine supply, and the production, taxation, and trafficking of illicit narcotics would provide the FARC with much of their revenue. Right-wing paramilitary groups were also involved in the trade, so it's not something that's like they're innocent, and this is something that would fuel conflict as the groups competed for territory and also fought over ideology. It was all mixed. So it's a bit more complex, but still, the FARC absolutely dominated things. In 2009, as an example, the U.S. government would report that the FARC was responsible for 60% of Colombian cocaine that was exported to the United States. And the U.S. Treasury Department froze the assets of several FARC members it identified as significant narcotic traffickers. Estimates of the income of the FARC derived from the sale of narcotics vary if you're wondering about the exact monetary amount. In 2015, Insight Crime, an online publication that specializes in organized crime in Latin America and the Caribbean, estimated that the figure was between $150 and $500 million a year. In 2012, Colombia's defense minister, Juan Carlos Pizon, would also say that it could be as high as $3.5 billion, we just don't really know. But either way, in the 2002 presidential election, Colombians would go and elect Alvaro Uribe, who pledged to take a hardline stance against the guerrillas. As his administration cracked down on the leftist rebel groups, violence would fall dramatically. Homicides from this crackdown would fall by 40%, and kidnappings would drop by 80% during Uribe's first term. But, in order to make these things possible, international rights groups would accuse Uribe's administration of violating human rights. Colombian courts would even go and investigate allegations that Uribe had links to right-wing paramilitary groups, but ultimately from this, no evidence or direct links were ever actually found. It's from this, then, that many experts would say that Uribe's administration crackdown would lay the foundation for peace talks. By the time the FARC would agree to negotiations in 2012, its ranks had fallen from 15 to 20,000 to maybe some 7,000 members. Which, as you can imagine, is a huge loss over time. Following an open war against the Colombian state, and after several military defeats during the government of Alvar Uribe from 2002 to 2010, the FARC began to weaken severely. After the 2008 death of Pedro Antonio Marin, who was, in other words, Manuel Tirafio Marlanda, the long 
longest serving ideological and military commander of FARC, the group would focus less on controlling territory and more on using guerrilla warfare tactics combined with strengthening its urban networks and increasing its political reach. Thus it is then, in 2012, that the group began peace negotiations again with the government of then-President Juan Manuel Santos, which would culminate in 2016 with the signing of a peace agreement between the guerrilla group and the Colombian president, marking the end of the organization. Former FARC leaders now would hold seats in the national legislature, and these seats were protected and set aside exclusively for members of FARC. The peace agreement would call for FARC's roughly 7,000 rebels to gather in 23 different hamlets across the country and turn in their arms to a UN commission. The accord would also outline a plan for the military to clear landmines that had been scattered throughout the countryside, which have killed or injured 11,000 people over the last 30 years. Yes, that is right. This is not a mine clearing operation at the end of World War II, this is in the modern day and age. At one point in time, the primary way the guerrillas were keeping out army forces was by literally spamming out mines all over the battlefield, creating virtual no man's land all across the countryside that still, to this day, cause multiple amputations every single year amongst military service members who are trying to disarm them, or just random people who are out walking by and who happen to accidentally step on a mine that has been there for the last 20 odd years. Colombia has actually one of the highest rates in the world of amputees, specifically because of this defensive strategy. Because of things like this, Santos has appealed for international support to finance development, public services, and justice institution in former conflict areas. Most of this support has in turn come from the United States so far. In June of 2016, the U.S. House of Representatives would appropriate approximately $490 million in aid, with a portion of the funds being dependent on Colombia reaching a peace deal in the first place. As part of the agreement, Santos' administration would also pledge to spend billions of dollars in rural areas, which many Colombians, including the rebels, say have long been neglected. It's one of the key reasons as to why they were able to take over many areas in the first place, because of this neglect. Many hoped that the investments, which experts have said could cost between 80 and 90 billion dollars over the next 10 years, would create economic alternatives to, you know, the drug trade. The two sides would finally reach a ceasefire in mid-2016, and Santos and FARC leader Rodrigo Londono would sign a peace treaty in the city of Cartagena in September of 2016. On August 15th, 2017, the FARC would turn over the last of their accessible weapons to the UN representatives, bringing the total of decommissioned weapons to more than 8,100 guns and around 1.3 million cartridges. With this action, the Colombian government declared an official end to the conflict with FARC. FARC would begin its transition into a political party that was guaranteed at least 10 unelected seats in the Colombian legislature, five in the House of Representatives and five in the Senate. It felt, at this point, like the internal civil war could finally be over. The people were so incredibly hopeful for a brief moment. But, as I'm sure you all know on this channel when we talk about how bad things get, it gets worse again. Eventually, reality was going to sneak in. Following their demobilization, several FARC commanders would form various different dissident militia groups collectively known as the ex-FARC Mafia. Another unexpected effect of the FARC going legal was that it would spell the end to decades of delicately balanced criminal hierarchy in the entire region. Not every single person wanted to give up even if the leaders did. There would be elements of FARC that wanted to continue on because the drug trade and everything that they were controlling was making them rich. And that would cause violence to spread to Venezuela, Brazil, Mexico, Peru, and Ecuador as the power vacuum left behind by FARC's absent was fought over. The ELN, after shunning drug trafficking for many years as anti-revolutionary, then recently turned to the trade. In late 2015, authorities found a massive cocaine processing complex run by the rebel group in Western Colombia. Rebel groups have also reportedly turned to illegal resource extraction, including gold mining, for additional income. When I am talking about all this, this is something that would coincide with the capture of El Chapo, the leader of the Sinaloa Mexican drug cartel, which allowed rival cartels like Jalisco New Generation, commonly known as CJNG, to ally with Ecuador's local gangs to muscle in on the international cocaine trade. And so due to the sudden absence of production and processing of coca, without the FARC being in the drug game anymore, gangs in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru began to make moves to get in on the top drug traffic game, because at this point, 
It was free real estate. For Mexican cartels, Pacific ports play a key role in the operations and logistics of illicit goods trafficking. Artisanal fishermen in Ecuador's coastal cities were co-opted to provide logistical assistance to criminal groups that were engaged in the trafficking. In 2022, officials would estimate that in the Department of Esmeraldas, around 72% of the gasoline for artisanal fishing that the government provided was sold to criminal networks. For European groups, the Pacific ports would also become key in the surge in demand for cocaine in the continent, especially as Colombia's port security has been tightened. Given that most of the cocaine flow happens via commercial shipping networks. Albanian mafia groups such as the Azemi and the Rexepi gangs have become dominant brokers in cocaine trafficking to Europe by aligning with local gangs in Ecuador. And I know that I did a video on this here before, which is why this whole thing is related to the issue that we talked about in that previous Ecuadorian video. If you have not seen that, by all means, go back and check that out because we worked really hard on making that thing. But Ecuadorian gangs, unlike what happens with cartels, these things were not based out of the jungle. They were based out of prisons. These were prison-based organizations whose logistical centers were actually the penitentiaries where they were locked up. From the penitentiaries, where each section of the prison would be separated and controlled by each one of the major gangs, leaders of these criminal groups would direct drug trafficking and targeted killings and rule organized crime on the street. Competition for control of the prisons would even lead to some of the highest homicide rates in Ecuador. A 2022 study revealed that if Ecuador's prison system were a city, it would be, after Guayaquil, the second most violent city in the country. And that is despite it being basically a police state, because it is a prison. These acts of violence are not isolated events. They instead reflect the struggle for territorial control inside and outside the prisons. Now it is then, less than a decade after the end of the conflict and the peaceful resolution of FARC, that has actually caused violence to overwhelm Ecuador, which has caused it to develop one of the highest murder rates in the entire world. Its new young president, Daniel Naboa, has recently pledged to make the country safe again, and he's taking a hardline stance on the gangs and narco traffic in a very similar way that El Salvador's Nayib Bukele has done. For context of this violence that I am talking about, the waves of violence that are experienced in Ecuador typically occur after the death of a powerful gang leader, something which reflects the subsequent fight over territorial control as everything breaks apart. If you want to give this any kind of comparison to medieval history, you could think of it with Gavelkind, when a king dies, the land gets divided amongst all of his sons, and then those sons, rather than being happy with the territory that they control, decide, hey, I want all the other brothers' territories too. As an example of just one of these things, the death of the leader of Los Cheneros, Jorge Luis Zambrano, in 2021, would lead to the split of the gang into two different factions, Las Aguillas and Los Fatales. This would ignite a wave of violence in Ecuador's prisons as the two new gangs now fought for control of the other respective territory that they used to hold. While it is that Los Cheneros remains a powerful criminal faction in Ecuador, this is only one of many, many examples that we could talk about, because honestly, if we wanted to do an entire episode that was dedicated to Ecuadorian gangs and all these other gangs and how they interact, make sure to go ahead and like this video and let me know in the comments, because oh my god, are there so many stories that we could tell from this. But either way, buoyed by money and guns that were provided by transnational criminal organizations, the clashes between gangs in contested territories became even deadlier over time. From January to June of 2023, intentional homicides with firearms increased 897% compared to the same period in 2019. And during in-prison interviews, security experts identified arms trafficking coming in from Chile via Peru, and through the northern border of Colombia as one of the main destabilizing factors in the country. A drastic rise in weapons trafficking can be seen where, from 2021, Ecuadorian authorities had seized 1,299 cartridges and 155 magazines to different types of weapons, to in 2024, this year, the armed forces had seized 84,164 cartridges, 996 magazines, and over 1,500 firearms in the span of 22 days alone. Not a year, 22 days. According to Ecuadorian Organized Crime Observatory, or OECO, around 55% of the international firearms seized in Ecuador are manufactured in the United States. Like in many countries in Latin America, assault weapons and automatic guns are illegal in Ecuador, but that does not stop people trying to smuggle them in from wherever it is that they can get them. So it is then, my friends, that the problems left by FARC being out of the narco trade game are numerous and with multiple effects. 
You'll remember the disgruntled ex-FARC members I talked about before who reformed new militias that were dubbed ex-FARC Mafia. Well, it's by this point then in 2022 and 2023 that they really begin to grow in numbers, swelling to 17,600 members in four major armed groups that the government is attempting to negotiate with. And so it's just like its own replacement to FARC in the first place. It's back right where they started. The current president, Gustavo Petro, the country's first left this president claims that the war on drugs was a failure. He has vowed to continue to root out the drug trade in his country by transitioning peasants from growing coca to other products instead of, you know, just burning their coca fields and leaving them with nothing like other presidents had tried. Despite being nicer, this is still very hard to do because for many rural communities, it's literally the only crop that people grow. 120,000 families grow coca in Colombia currently, and if not given the incentive to grow legal crops, they're just going to keep growing it because it's all they really know how to do and how they make money. Thing is, I've talked about profitability of all this. If the government did not go and subsidize the growing of food crops, if they didn't pay extra for them, cocoa was going to continue to be the only thing that people actually grew because it was simply that profitable and it was all that people knew. So the government proposed to do exactly just that. They set up a new program and called on the peasants to go legal. And in 2020, over 100,000 families would sign up for the government's substitution program designed to wean them off of growing coca. Yet in the ultimate insult, after they'd already planted a less valuable crop, less than 1% of the families who joined the program actually received any of the subsidies from the government. This means that for the 99,000 families, their income was reduced by more than half due to the government's broken promises. When Gustavo Petro would then come into office, he made sure to address these issues and promise to provide a real solution. The new policy would look to implement environmental management and measures to conserve and restore areas affected by drug trafficking, while at the same time tackling drug use with a focus on public health and human rights. The plan would encourage the voluntary eradication of coca crops to replace the plants with coffee, cocoa, fruits, and even cannabis. The plan would also see the state increase its presence in Colombia's remote regions. These efforts didn't really work. In 2022, coca crops covered some 2,300 square kilometers of Colombia's territory, which was up 13% from the previous year, while potential cocaine output rose 24% to 1,738 metric tons. It really seems at this point as if Colombia's past, present, and future have been shaped by one exclusive crop in a way that the world has possibly never seen before. It's part of the nation's identity, whether you love it or hate it, and it's not going to be going away anytime soon. The efforts by the government have failed, whether that was due to people not caring to participate enough or from the government failing to provide what it needed in the first place, they haven't worked. But that being said, it will be interesting to see how Colombia's efforts to tackle the effects of coca can affect change upon the region in much the same way that the absence of FARC has. Petro, as it stands, is arguably doing his best, but the ceasefire deal that he had with the National Liberation Army, the ELN, recently ran out, and it has yet to negotiate a new peace. So while the Colombian army continues to dig up millions of landmines and Petro attempts to potentially rewrite the country's constitution, a new generation of guerrilla fighters are growing in size in the jungles of Colombia. Again. Yes, I know, it sounds like I'm a, just a broken record here at this point. It has been six decades, and yet still, Colombia does not know lasting peace. And unfortunately, for those forced to choose between growing coca and starving, the government continues to promise things that it hasn't actually been able to provide. Will Petro actually be able to keep his word, or will he, like all other presidents before him, not fulfill those promises and instead crack down, uselessly fighting against the crisis that is the Colombian drug trade? I personally do not know but we will be sure to go ahead and keep an eye on things and update you should there be any major developments. This has been the absolutely insane story of FARC and the Colombian drug trade. This has been Sakui with the History of Everything podcast. I ask that you like, comment, and subscribe. At the same time, if you want to get ad-free episodes of the podcast, make sure to go and check out Patreon. In my previous video that I had done and on a number of my other videos I have found, a number of people have started to complain that more of what I cover now is current events and the history behind them. Which yes, this is true. I am guilty as charged. But it is what people have wanted to see. Unfortunately, when I posted episodes of the podcast and pure history content on here, it did not perform as well. And when you sink over a week into a project and pay editors to get it made only for it to fail to make any of that investment back, well, I can't run things while continuously being in the red. 
So while I will be making some pure history content to go on here, it needs to be viable. And simultaneously, if you want my pure, unadulterated history content, then go and check out my Patreon. Go and check out my podcast, the actual History of Everything podcast. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate all of you, and I will see you next time. Goodbye, my friends.